Tango Juliet Alpha, radar departure, turn right, heading 170, clear for immediate takeoff. Tango Juliet Alpha. Australia is a safe place to fly. It's been that way for over 50 years. Yet for these air travellers at the start of the 1970s, the memory of local aviation disasters remained vivid. As recently as 1968, a Vickers Viscount airliner had come apart in the air, killing all 26 people on board. Focused on Sydney's mascot aerodrome, this movie will show that Australia's aviation safety record didn't come out of the blue. Accidents change more than just how we build and fly aeroplanes. They also involve regulations, infrastructure, control systems and cultural changes that extend far beyond the aviation sector. These technical, environmental and human factors have helped us shape safer skies. The very first international flight to Australia, arriving from England in December 1919, landed in Darwin with just four people on board. Over the following 50 years, developments in Australian aviation were often closely connected with flying accidents. In November 1922, Nigel Love watched a test flight of a Royal Australian Air Force Avro 504K trainer. Love was the owner of Sydney's newly established mascot aerodrome. He was also a director of the Australian Aircraft and Engineering Company, which had just put the Avro together. But something went wrong. The throttle control came loose in the pilot's hand, so he urgently shut down his engine. Attempting a power-off landing on the aerodrome, his wheels snagged the boundary fence, and the aircraft tipped onto its nose. To add insult to injury, the hangar in which the wrecked Avro was stored later collapsed in a storm. It seemed like a poor start for a new industry. But in addition to establishing the cause of the accident, the Air Force inquiry also revealed something else. It confirmed that even by 1922, Mascot Aerodrome was an active centre for Australian aviation. In addition to the collapsed hangar, there was also a boundary fence and Love's factory where aircraft were being assembled and tested. They met a growing need for basic aeroplanes to serve a new sense of air-mindedness developing across Australia. But, as the fate of just one aeroplane in this 1930 photograph of Mascot Aerodrome reminds us, flying accidents were frequent, if not always fatal. The de Havilland Moth was the standard training workhorse of early Australian aviation. This particular aeroplane, on the left in the previous picture, suffered a series of non-fatal and usually minor accidents through the 1930s. It was finally written off in 1941, after a severe crash at Mascot. Moths helped open up aviation to rookie flyers who could afford training, including a growing number of women pilots. Many moth accidents were relatively minor because the aircraft was slow and stable. In contrast, the de Havilland Tiger Moth Racer was fast but tricky to fly. Taking this sleek monoplane up for an unauthorised flight at Mascot in 1930, pilot Dave Smith was thrown out and fell to his death. The aircraft was also destroyed. As with earlier accidents, the inquiry into Smith's death documented the growing aviation culture and infrastructure growing up at Mascot. Locals not only knew the pilots, but also the names, shapes and sounds of familiar aircraft, like the Moth, plus new types, such as the Tiger Moth. What really drove the development of commercial aviation in Australia was subsidies for carrying airmail. It accelerated how quickly we could correspond with each other and with the wider world. Airmail soon celebrated its own importance in stamps such as this commemoration of the first Trans-Pacific flight by the Fokker 7 3M Southern Cross. While Australians rapidly embraced airmail, early airlines had to emphasise the safety of flying in order to attract passengers. Australia's first civil aviation disaster involved an airliner very similar to the Southern Cross, an Avro 10 named Southern Cloud. 
departing from Mascot Aerodrome for Melbourne on the 21st of March 1931. It carried two crew and six passengers. Heading into almost cyclonic weather conditions, the southern cloud vanished. Illustrating the massive growth in local aviation since 1919, a huge aerial search was launched across eastern Australia. These desperate efforts came up blank. Only in 1958, 27 years after it disappeared, was the southern cloud's wreckage found in rugged mountain country near Cooma. Crash investigators proposed that the Avro had been blown hundreds of kilometres off course, flying into mountainous terrain. Caught in a steep valley in minimal visibility, its end was quick. The immediate and obvious consequence of the Southern Cloud disaster was the need for a radio communications network along the main air routes of the country so that the pilot was always in contact with somebody on the ground and also for a much improved weather forecasting and reporting service so that the pilot knew of changed conditions along the air route and at his destination. These services were provided in the late 1930s by the Department of Civil Aviation and it was known as the Air Radio Service. The rediscovery of the Southern Cloud drove home the risks faced both by pilots and by passengers in the 1930s. Starting in 1939, the Second World War completely transformed flying and the infrastructure of aviation across Australia. On top of Australian civilian and military aircraft, other services also operated out of Mascot Aerodrome. One was Britain's Royal Air Force Transport Command. On the 19th of July, 1945, one of their heavily laden consolidated C-87 Liberators departed for distant Manus Island. Although the cause remained unclear, Liberator EW631 apparently lifted off too early, crashing just beyond the aerodrome. The resulting explosion damaged homes in nearby suburbs. The 12 servicemen aboard, members of the Royal Air Force, Royal Navy and Royal New Zealand Air Force, were all killed. A civilian living nearby, Gordon Knowles, suffered significant injuries trying to save the victims from the flames. For his bravery, he won the George Medal, the Humane Society's Gold Medal and the St John's Bronze Life Saving Medal. Coming just before the end of World War II, the Liberator crash fueled calls to expand Mascot Aerodrome. One of those voices was Nigel Love, once the owner of the site and now president of the Air Force Association. Five million pounds was allocated in 1945 to transform Mascot, ready to handle fleets of larger, heavier airliners. It was part of a massive national investment in aviation infrastructure, including radio navigation beams along major airways. After a series of deadly post-war accidents, by the early 1950s, Australian aviation had earned an enviable reputation for safety. This was in part due to tight government control of maintenance, inspection, aircrew and airways standards. Although still expensive, airline travel came to be seen as reliable and even safe. But risks were ever-present, especially on long international flights. Differences in understanding new radio navigation systems were blamed for the deaths of 19 passengers on the 29th of October 1953. Arriving from Mascot, British Commonwealth Pacific Airways Douglas DC-6 Resolution crashed into a hill just prior to landing in San Francisco. Accidents could also occur owing to fundamental errors. Departing for regional centre Tamworth, an East West Airlines Douglas DC-3 took off from Mascot on the 4th of November 1957. Faced with backfiring and losing power, the captain shut down the left engine. However, the backfiring continued. Fully fuelled and carrying 27 people, his airliner steadily sank towards the suburbs beneath him. The DC-3 descended so low that it collided with television antennas on the homes below. Suddenly, a dark area appeared up ahead. 
narrowly avoiding the built-up areas all around, the captain executed a skillful ditching in a water reserve beside East Lake Golf Course. 30,000 locals flocked to the scene, forming what police described as the worst behaved crowd they had ever seen. All aboard survived, suffering nothing more than wet feet. But the crash came close to being a major suburban tragedy. Investigators concluded that in the dark and confusion of the emergency, the pilot had shut down the wrong engine, sealing the airliner's fate. A significant development in airline safety from the mid-1950s was the introduction of reliable turbine engines. Powering both turboprop and pure jet types, they helped aircraft fly faster and higher, above or around bad weather. But even the newest aircraft weren't immune to severe weather. On the 30th of November 1961, a Vickers Viscount named John Oxley departed mascot for the national capital of Canberra. It took off into a storm so violent that many locals still remember it today. The Ansett ANA airliner then vanished from radio contact. Its disappearance recalled the mystery of the Southern Cloud 30 years earlier. These days when there's an accident, the media usually reports that the aircraft disappeared from air traffic control radar displays. Well, at the time of this accident, there was a primitive type of radar in use in Sydney Tower, but they weren't actually using it to track the aircraft. So when the Viscount failed to respond to a radio call, they had really no idea where the aircraft had gone. But the next morning, wreckage was found scattered across Botany Bay. All four crew and 11 passengers had died. Thankfully, the Viscount hadn't come down on its planned flight track above Sydney's eastern suburbs. Reconstruction of the wreckage and its debris trail suggested that the right wing, then the right tailplane, had failed in flight. This was likely caused by the pilot's efforts to control the Viscount in severe turbulence. The investigators concluded that the aircraft encountered some force in flight which was greater than it was designed to withstand. Some of the important outcomes from the Botany Bay Viscount accident were that the Department of Civil Aviation introduced a requirement for all turbine-powered passenger-carrying aircraft to be fitted with weather radar. It also added impetus to earlier recommendations for large passenger-carrying aircraft to be fitted with flight data recorders so that accidents could be more easily investigated. Also, for the first time, air traffic controllers were provided with information about severe weather in the area around the major capital city airports. Despite two other fatal Viscount accidents in 1966 and 1968, the safety and reliability of Australia's airlines continued to improve. The new tourist class airfares of the 1950s, coupled with the larger and faster aircraft of the 1960s, made flying more and more affordable. Australians increasingly took the reliability and safety of air travel for granted. Between 1962 and 1969, domestic passenger numbers more than doubled from 2.8 to 5.9 million. This figure represented nearly half the continent's entire population at the end of the 60s. As early as 1961, the number of travellers coming to Australia by air had outstripped those arriving by sea. Mass air transport was making the nation ever more cosmopolitan. But joining the jet set required more than just jets. New international airliners, especially the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8, required ever longer runways. Mascot was just one of the nation's airports requiring a massive infrastructure investment to improve its safety and air traffic capacity. But aircraft weren't alone in the skies above. Large, open areas of ground like airports, often attract flocks of birds. The presence of municipal rubbish tips, as was the case near Mascot, increases the risk of potentially catastrophic bird strikes. On the 1st of December 1969, a Pan Am Boeing 707 was seriously damaged while taking off from Mascot. Bound for Honolulu, Jet Clipper Star King collided with a flock of seagulls during its takeoff run. It lost engine power at a critical moment and the captain aborted the takeoff. Skidding to a stop, the airliner came to rest just off the end of the runway. All 11 crew and 125 passengers survived. 
but had it taken to the air, overloaded and underpowered, the 707 might have come down into Sydney's crowded inner western suburbs. Luckily, no fire broke out in the fully fuelled Boeing. While it was successfully evacuated in two minutes, the accident hastened the creation of major disaster plans for city airports. The need for such a plan was narrowly avoided at Mascot on the 29th of January 1971. Outbound for Perth, a Trans Australia Airways Boeing 727 named James Cook commenced its takeoff roll. Suddenly, the 727's flight crew realised that another airliner was heading down the same runway directly towards them. This was a Canadian Pacific Airlines Douglas DC 8, Empress of Hong Kong. Between them, the two jets were carrying 240 people. Choosing to continue his takeoff, the TAA captain pulled his 727 into the air. By the narrowest of margins, both aircraft survived the collision. Subsequent inquiries into this near disaster, however, went all the way up to the High Court of Australia. It was the first time that a cockpit voice recording had been used in an Australian court case. The judges laid blame upon both of the air crews, as well as the air traffic controllers, who could barely see the events from their tower just on dusk. Just six years later, the world witnessed its deadliest aviation accident in very similar circumstances. 583 people died when two Boeing 747s collided on a runway in the Canary Islands. Sadly, the 1970s didn't mark the end of accidents at Mascot, but the trend was plain to see. Our air safety record didn't come out of the blue. Early crashes were often the result of the unknown, or even the unthinkable. Some were difficult to explain, perhaps resulting from split-second decisions that turned out to be wrong. Others highlighted problems with communication and control systems. From basic engineering to severe weather, many tested the limits of knowledge. But from the earliest days, Australians have invested heavily in flying safely. The tragedies of those first decades helped shape the safer skies we've enjoyed for the last 50 years. Coming out of a difficult history, it's a heritage we can be proud of.